It is 10 o'clock. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, humid. I was just explaining earlier that uh, the last time I baked, the brown sugar in my cupboard was rock hard. And last night when I went to bake cookies for our fellowship time after worship, that same brown sugar was warm and squishy and was fine. So I discovered that you need approximately 90% humidity in order to maintain brown sugar in a usable state. Uh, I think we all feel a little bit like that too uh, in this heat and humidity, a little warm and squishy, but uh, I think worship will be wonderful. Uh, we are gathered here together in this space. We have people at home that come regularly or sometimes, so welcome to you as well. Uh, as far as announcements goes, I, I was gonna say they're in your bulletin, but we don't have an announcement sheet. I don't have any announcements. Does anyone else have something to share? There's a picnic at Duffy's next week. Yes, thank you. Next Sunday after worship, there is a church family picnic at uh, Duffy White Houses. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet below. If you haven't signed up and are able to come, please do so. Uh, thank you for remembering that. It's a beautiful setting, and if we all pray really hard that the weather cooperates, perhaps it will. We'll see what God has in mind. Any other announcements? Then let us listen to the sound of the bell and the prelude as we prepare ourselves to worship God together this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace from God, our creator, from Jesus Christ, our redeemer, and from the Holy Spirit this day and always. Amen. Peace be with you. Our opening hymn, according to the insert, is number 227.
seated. Our call to worship this morning and the following unison gathering prayer are printed in our inserts. Please join me in reading the call to worship responsively. Come, neighbors and strangers, prophets and seekers of justice, those who need a helping hand, and those who have something to offer. Whether your faith is weak or strong, come, let us be neighbors in this place, and let us worship God together. Let us pray. God of love and compassion, you call us to be people of compassion too, to experience in our living the lives of others, to laugh with their joys and cry with their sorrows. In this time of worship, speak to us again your words of love and remind us again of what it means to be a neighbor. We pray in the name of Jesus, the ultimate neighbor, amen. Let us with boldness approach God's grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, reading together the litany of confession again from our inserts. Let us pray. God of grace, when we hear prophets calling to us to measure up and we turn away, forgive us. When we see our neighbors in need and turn away, forgive us. When we assume we are too busy or too important to get involved, forgive us. When we try to discredit prophetic voices so that we can ignore them, forgive us. When we fail to measure up to being your people, forgive us and our prayers continue in the silence of our hearts. Hear these words of assurance of God's pardon and the law of Christ. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God the Father, who indeed intercedes for us. So if anyone is in Christ, there is new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Believe this good news and go and live in peace. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your spirit and your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws depend all the law and the prophets. This is the good news of the gospel. Therefore, let us stand and join our voices together in singing to the glory of God. Please join me in prayer. 
holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world, resound with God's own heart, words of life and hope, which give us strength to cope and to guide us. Ancient words ever true, let us hear with open hearts. Amen. From Genesis, the birth of Esau and Jacob. This is the story of Abraham's son Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, an Aramean from Mesopotamia and sister of Laban. Because Rebekah had no children, Isaac prayed to the Lord for her. The Lord answered his prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant. She was going to have twins. And before they were born, they struggled against each other in the womb. She said, why should something like this happen to me? So she went to the Lord for an answer. The Lord said to her, two nations are within you. You will give birth to two rival peoples. One will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. The time came for her to give birth, and she had twin sons. The first one was reddish, and his skin was like a hairy robe, so he was named Esau. The second one was born holding on tightly to the heel of Esau, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. Esau sells his rights as the firstborn son. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skilled hunter, a man who loved the outdoors. But Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac preferred Esau because he enjoyed eating the animals Esau killed. But Rebekah preferred Jacob. One day, while Jacob was cooking some bean soup, Esau came in from hunting. He was hungry and said to Jacob, I'm starving. Give me some of that red stuff. This is why he was named Edom. Jacob answered, I will give it to you if you give me your rights as the firstborn son. Esau said, All right, I am about to die. What good will my rights do me? Jacob answered, First, make a vow that you will give me your rights. Esau made the vow and gave his rights to Jacob. Then Jacob gave him some bread and some of the soup. He ate and drank and then got up and left. That was all Esau cared about his rights as the firstborn son. The word of God. Our sermon hymn is number 304.
Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you know anyone who has difficulty considering outcomes prior to their taking action? Um, do you know anyone who is sly enough to take advantage of such a person for their own benefit? Is that fair? Does God bless both? So is God fair? This story of Jacob and Esau doesn't seem to reflect any way that we think God should work in the world. It seems to be a pattern in the Old Testament, but we could say a lot about the Old Testament. They need to be unpacked, these stories, to make sense in our sensibility. And this one is no exception. There are a couple of really noteworthy details that are embedded in this story kind of glossed right through at the beginning. Uh, Rebecca was barren. She was unable to have children. She didn't have these twins for 20 years until Isaac prayed to God and said, please. It's kind of reminiscent of his own mother and father, Abraham and Sarah, who had no children and no children and no children. And finally, Isaac was born in God's good time. Another interesting detail is Rebecca speaks directly to God and God speaks directly back to Rebecca. This happens to another woman. We heard it with Hagar and we hear it again with Rebecca. God says the boys that are warring in your womb will be important leaders of men, fathers of nations, and the youngest will serve the oldest. What a setup for uh, sibling rivalry. We can't overlook those details in every single Bible story. There are little nuggets thrown out to us. Um, and, and we are tempted, I think, I know I am, from childhood on, we hear the stories of the men and I never heard the stories of the women involved. There is a cultural bias historically around men, but God always is an equal creator who cares for everyone in creation, not only the one who is smart and sly, but also the one who is careless. The earliest myth creations across culture, when we think about it, generally involve important topics, and this is Genesis, this is the beginning of our scripture, topics such as death, trying humanly to understand it, and decay, and relationships, and loss, infanticide, contamination and purity, what is good, what is not good, what is proper and acceptable ritual and ceremonial order, including birth order, and the functions of gender and age in the world, in life, in relationships. It's powerful stuff when you combine it with the relative importance and brevity of your own life, I've found. But we have stereotypes depicted here. The trickster, Jacob, the younger son, that one who came out of the womb grabbing onto the heel of his brother Esau, almost like he wanted to be first and couldn't make it. Um, and yet he is the agent of change, of bringing about in some way the intention of God in and for the world. We have Isaac, we have Jacob mentioned as the ancestors of Jesus. And that's a tough one to assimilate into our own sense of what is right, when the sly younger one gets the better of the, the good guy, the old, older one. What we need to pay attention to, though, in this story, in these stories as they unfold, is that God manages to work through everyone's story, not just the one who wins, but everybody gets God's blessing. Esau, 
slash Edom. That's a play on words in the Hebrew. They both mean red. And Edom became the land where Esau settled. The, the hunters, the strong people, the fighters. Um, I, I heard one commentator say the uh, jocks of the world. Um, everyone gets God's blessing. So we have to look for an assurance of God's faithfulness to all people. Can God be trusted no matter what in our own lives? Well, once again, the answer is unequivocally yes. God is present. God cares. Our struggles with how we live out our lives in relationship to God, God with us, are all part and parcel of how we live our lives in relationship to other people, especially family. And at the end of the day, everyone, Jesus says, is family. There is definitely typecasting going on between the boys in today's story and the descriptions and the characters. Esau is, a, is daddy's boy. Daddy loves him because he hunts meat and brings it home and, and Isaac loves meat. And Jacob is mommy's boy who stays home, is more contemplative, who helps around the house, who's a good lad. Um, it's another example, another biblical example of the younger being lifted up above the older son. That's another theme that runs through the Old Testament. We have Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's boys, who the story did not end well. We have Ishmael and Isaac. We covered a couple weeks ago Abraham, Abraham's two boys. We have coming up Joseph, the youngest son, well, not the youngest, the next to youngest, who winds up saving all of his family. Family norms, then, are always brought into question throughout the stories in our scripture. Rivalries and family issues are raised. Family stories are sorted out from the beginning of time. Stories of favoritism. What can we learn from them about flawed people and imperfect families? and especially sorting out where God is in all this. Because the truth is, this is a very messy story, and it gets messier, much like life. We can't ignore how devious Jacob is. Jacob is downright sneaky, uh, and he gets his later on when his purported father-in-law becomes sneakier than he. We can't stereotype Esau, the older brother, as a dumb oaf, and champion Jacob. There are no absolutes here, except attending to the power of God to make use of what there is available. There are paradigms that transcend culture and country. And I, I think about the Marvel comics. We have Thor and Loki, Norse gods. These same differences are illustrated in old Greek mythology about the dispute that arose between half-brothers, Apollo and Hermes. These are elemental issues. Both were mighty sons of Zeus, if you recall, the god of sky and thunder and the ruler of the Olympian gods. It's always the gods or God who ultimately arbitrates and negotiates, who has all of the power at the end of the day, and who gives us power through the love of Jesus Christ to mitigate and resolve conflicts. We find God's presence in the world, in the word, and in waiting for God to make God's presence known in our own lives as they unfold. So that begs the question to me, what is the birthright then of the people of God? Esau just gave up his birthright for a, a bowl of soup, it sounds like, although hunting was not such an easy thing. He may literally have been out for days, if not weeks, and come home literally starving. And Jacob knew it and took advantage of it. And so Esau said, yes, what good is life? It's living with some soup without my birthright versus dying. 
So what good is a birthright if I can't use it anyway? Um, what is our birthright as people of God, as the church of God in the world? Who are we and how do we use that gift? Um, what do we or what are we willing to give up? Uh, what compromises are we willing to make in order to continue to live? Have we given up being able to share the good news about God in some way? Or put boxes around what is the good news of God? What is the essential thing of being church? Those are questions that we ask over and over again to make sure that we're not giving up the essence of what God wants for us. The key is not sell your birthright for a bowl of chili in the world. In our desperation to survive as an entity, what are we willing to give up? What do we need to give up so that God continue to work through us? We have to be wary, but we also have to be cunning. But above all, above all, we have to be faithful and listen for God's direction. This story is uh, ultimately a foundational story, one that explains the origin of uh, something Jacob's or Israel's preference by God over Esau, Edom. The preference is underscored later in the texts when the vocation of Esau and Jacob are explained. Esau is the hunter, Jacob is not. Um, Killing is held up throughout the next several books as something to be avoided. It's, it's uh, an aversion of gods. Um, the Edomites and those like them were descended from a people with an inclination to violence. So we have these stereotypes lined up from the beginning, whereas Israel, uh, Jacob's children, come from a stock that lives in cult in a covenant with other elements of creation. Very different approaches to how to get through life. Um, none of the players in this story really come off well. They give the lie to that biblical uh, image of family values. I, anytime I hear family values, Christian family values, and look at stories in the Bible, Oh my goodness, the family values or the one husband and one wife, a nuclear family does not exist. It is not biblical. Um, none of these people offer uh, a good model for the history of salvation. Far from it. And because of that, we all can be encouraged, frankly because who of us comes from a perfect family? The unexpected ascendancy of this youngest son is a common pattern, as I said, in the Bible. Um, it's Isaac rather than Ishmael who wins the day in Abraham's family. Um, Joseph, who sees his dreams fulfilled when his older brothers bow down to him in Egypt. David, the youngest of all Jesse's sons, is anointed king by Samuel. And when his elder brothers cower in fear, the boy David emerges as victorious over Goliath. These stories run through. Similar Bible stories of the youngest son rising to prominence contradict expectations and legalities and conventions of society. The weak and the marginal become the surprising means through which God works in Israel and in the world. We are called as church, as people of God, to look around and identify those marginal, those people who are less than or quick to make decisions that don't necessarily reflect healthy outcomes and to help them. The different lifestyles of Esau and Jacob, as well as the people they represent, are clearly delineated in this passage. Jacob exploits the differences between the boys when his brother returns home exhausted. 
And the concluding verse here implies that Esau himself was to blame for his loss of status because he didn't value it more highly than lentil soup. What he valued, though, was continuing on with his life so that he could continue to do God's work. Conflict is often viewed as something to be avoided, ignored, quickly resolved, and yet from the beginning of scripture we have conflict between brothers, between peoples. Um, if you remember, those of us of a certain age, the Smothers Brothers made a career with Tommy's mantra to Dick, Mom always liked you best, because it resonates. It was humor that touched home for many. The story of Esau and Jacob challenges us to acknowledge rivalry as a part of life by showing us that sibling rivalry is at its most basic and stereotypical, selfish and divisive when the truth of it is that even through our struggles, or especially through our struggles, God is present and active and extends blessings to all peoples. How many of you are the oldest child, or the youngest child, or the middle child, and know your role, even so, Recently, as I want to say two months ago, I come from a family of four girls. The youngest said, yeah, but I'll always be the youngest. <laughs> so it, it continues. We understand it. Um, only children. Both of my parents were only children. And they used to look with wonder at the four of us girls bickering. That was my mom's favorite mantra girls stop bickering. I think it's something that God continues to say to the world because when we look around, there are nations, there are brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ who are bickering over who's the best, how to proceed, what's important now is in this moment for us to figure that out. Then is the past, yes, but it's also the future. We have then and we have then. And God is present and active and extending blessing to all peoples. That's the family we need to focus on. Let us pray. Oh God, you are our God of yesterday and today and tomorrow, and you created families of peoples, some strong, some weak, some thoughtful, some impetuous, some we know, some we fear. Help us all through Jesus Christ to come together as one body. We ask it in his name. Amen. It is our time now to dedicate the gifts that we're able to bring to God's people to continue Christ's work in the world. Let us join our voices and stand together in singing the doxology. Use them both 
in this place and wherever you might direct us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. As we turn to God in worship, let us turn to God in prayer. God of grace and love, we rely on your love extended to us in all ways and at all times, extravagantly and with generosity. You entrust us with the gift of the good news of the gospel and invite us to be partners in sharing your message of grace. We come to you to acknowledge and praise you for all your goodness to us and ask your blessing this day and in the days ahead. Source of life and hope, make us aware of our opportunities for witness and service, even in unlikely places and to unlikely people. Focus our attention on our responsibilities and not on the impact of what we're doing as your disciples. Take from us the desire for superficial success and strengthen our resolve to be faithful and responsive to the message of your inclusive love so demonstrated in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. O oh God of grace and glory, we give you thanks for the rhythm of the seasons and the constant provision for our needs in life. We are grateful for the commitment of those who look after our quality of life through food production, health care, and civic security. Bless each worker this day who is struggling to put food on the table and yet is faithful in showing up to help others. O oh God, we are aware of the injustices and ill division of wealth in our world and are mindful of the message of those who challenge our privileges, especially those we have taken for granted and have been so oblivious of. God of compassion, we pray for the many who are oppressed by crushing political and economic circumstances, those persecuted on grounds of faith or ethnicity or background or family history or where they live in the world. God, we ask you to empower and encourage and sustain those who are sick in mind, body, and spirit, the dying, those who care for them, that they may always be aware of the presence of your spirit among them and in their daily lives, minute by minute. Oh God, we pray for all whose lives, however apparently insignificant and lacking in prestige and power, are attempting to be faithful to the gospel in Jesus' name because they are confident in the inclusive love and mercy you have demonstrated in and through Jesus, in whose name we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this day is number 547. Thank you.
And so our service here has ended. Our service in the world continues, so go in peace. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen.